Welcome back to Raj Gets Real, the baseball edition, where we have unscripted conversations about everything baseball. Our goal here is to help educate and share everything we know about the game of baseball. And here's your host, Roger Gonzalez. All right, guys. So I'm excited to introduce my good friend here. Um, play ball with him. Brett Siddle, like the Skittle. That's kind of the way I got to say it so I can pronounce it right. Um, we met back in the day when one uh, fortunate enough to play with the Oakland A's. He was already, I think, a couple years into his league. Uh, he played pro ball for four years. He was a college guy, junior sign. Um, he's a he played in the Canadian national team. He's a Canada guy. So this is going to be a very interesting episode. So Brett, what's going on, brother? How you been, man? Raj, thanks for having me on, man. It's good to see you again. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. I mean, it's. I, I, I really don't know how else we would kind of get down and sit, sit and talk. You know, it's, it's tough to catch up in, in, in the world we're in and just kind of, but excited to have you on. I know you're, uh, I'm really excited to talk strength and conditioning side with you. I know that's a huge, huge aspect of your career and kind of what made you the player you were, but let's kind of take a step back. So Canada, bro, they don't play baseball in Canada. What's up? Like how that happened? Talk to me. Give me the story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're uh, obviously known for our hockey up here. Um, so growing N-A. up, a hockey, a so I was a big hockey guy, but I also uh, played baseball from a young age. My dad, my dad played professionally, and so uh, he kind of got me into it. And uh, yeah, so it was a big part of my life growing up, and my dream was always to be a you know pro baseball player. Um, so I was fortunate enough in high school to play for kind of the I guess you guys would call it like the state team. Uh, it's our provincial team. Uh, and then from there, I was recruited to play for the the Team Canada Junior National Team. Um, and so that's where I think my my career kind of took off in terms of getting opportunities for college and then eventually pro. But um, yeah, in Canada, that's the kind of route you go if you're trying to to develop that way. That's very interesting. So your pops played. Okay. I knew yeah. there had to be a connection here. Um, yeah. What level and what did he play pro and how what was that? Because so we're going to talk up- about that a lot. Yeah, yeah, he made it up to the big leagues. Um, really? Okay. Yeah, he played parts of four years in the big leagues um, with the Tigers, Marlins, and former Expos, uh, now the Nationals. Yeah. Uh, and then he finished his career in AAA. He was with the Red Sox uh, when he retired. Gotcha. So was he um, was he Canadian or you guys, like your whole family was Canada or did you guys move there at another point in your life? No, he's he's born and raised in Windsor, Ontario, um, right across the border from Detroit. Okay. What about what about grand, grandfather? Did he play baseball? No, no. My dad. So my dad was the was the first one kind of in the family. Okay. Uh, he came from a big family, and uh, he actually, I mean, crazy story. He went to school uh, on a scholarship for for football. Uh, he went to Central Michigan University. Wow. Um, on a full ride for football as a quarterback, and then. After his freshman year, he came back home for the summer and he uh, went to some tr- like kind of camp tryout and there was a Montreal Expo scout there and he, he wanted to sign him on the spot. So he, uh, he gave, so, up his, gave up his scholarship to do that. So uh, who's bigger? You or Pops? Because I mean, bigger? he's a football guy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now it's me. But yeah, I think back in the day, he, he was pretty big. I bet, man. I, that's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. So um, what? I mean, there's two sides that I see this that I really, let, let, let's take it with the pop side. And I would really love to kind of hear what he has to say too. But a lot of the guys that I've been talking to recently um, come from like myself, come from zero baseball family. Yeah. How do you think that having a father that I mean, he made it to the league, bro, you know, how yeah. hard that is, you know, and you know, you know, how, how much of an impact did your pops have in your career? Yeah, especially uh, being Canadian too. Um, you know, it's a little bit more rare in terms of, you know, making it to the big leagues. He's only one of, I don't know how many, a handful in my area to ever do anything with baseball. Um, so he's kind of a big baseball name in my community, but, um, yeah, I I don't know if I I don't, I wouldn't say I took it for granted growing up. He was always my coach, um, but it was just normal for me. Right. It It was normal to have that kind of coach dad figure and then come home and be able to go to the park and hit. Whereas other, other teammates, other guys on my team didn't really have, you know, their dads might be working or something, or they don't have a baseball background. Um, but to me, it was always like, he was just there if we wanted to get extra work in or, or, or whatever it might be. Um, and so I think it was honestly, it, it was extremely beneficial for me to have that growing up. 
Um, but again, he saying that he wasn't the dad or the coach that was on me all the time to, to be training and doing that. He kind of left it up to me. If I wanted to go, we would go. Um, and I, again, I don't think he wanted to push me to the point of like hating the game. Uh, and I'm kind of glad that, that he took that approach. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so many different sides to that. So just flat out, like you said, just the, the, the opportunity to be able to work and have a father that allowed you to do that and, you know, was there for you, but there's the other whole other side about, I mean, he really knew the mentality about it. Like he said, like you said, he didn't force it. Cause he's like, this is a long career. He's like, I'm not going to make this kid. Cause I mean, let's be real. We've seen a lot of, a lot of former teammates that were playing it to just make pops happy. Yeah. And it's like, you're not gonna, you're not, you're not really gonna do much with, with, with the career that way, and yeah. just the other side of just like the mechanics, the, 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 you know, the hitting, the mental, the approach, all that kind of stuff. How was that implemented? Was it at a young age, or would he just kind of let you play? How did that? How did he handle that? Yeah, so he was actually a catcher, um, and myself being left-handed, you know, I caught when I was younger, but I obviously knew that wasn't going to be uh, my route moving forward, and so. In terms of the defensive side of things, yeah, he kind of just, I played first base, pitched, outfield, you know, kind of what lefties can do. Uh, but yeah, he was more so instrumental, I would say, in, in the hitting aspect of things. Um, and again, he was known as a defensive catcher. He wasn't really an offensive guy, um, but just kind of having the connections that he had and, and, and kind of access to some of the information that, that he learned throughout his career. You know, he was able to help myself, my, my teammates growing up. Uh, with certain, you know, I would say hitting drills and hitting philosophies that I'd say other coaches and, and teams in our area didn't have access to. Um, and that definitely helped us out, you know, myself, some teammates, you know, as we moved through through our ranks as we grew up. Um, but yeah, it was always nice to have that that kind of feedback um, and being able to bounce bounce ideas and, and different things off of him as we as we trained. Yeah, I mean that's dude, that's so fortunate. And yeah. and for not just yourself, but all your boys and all your friends around it, you know, just yeah. the knowledge. And that's something that we keep talking in on this episode. And that's the platform. This is what this platform is, is to pr- provide that knowledge for the guys who can't have it. Is, you know, have conversations like this, have conversations with big leaguers and be like, how did you handle this? How did you learn this? What phase? Okay. Like, for example, yesterday, bro, yesterday we were talking with Trace and he was just like, dude, the moment that I started to look at analytics and realize I'm hitting 300 when I hit the ball at middle in versus 230 when I'm hitting the ball middle away. And I thought I was an apple hitter because I was a young guy. I was yeah. like, bro, like it's crazy, you know, like having these conversations to help them. So I'm sure that's kind of what happened with you on a, I wouldn't say day to day, but, you know, for the most part, like the way your pops, you know, dealt with it. I, was he your coach at every level of like, of a, like Corey league or like coach pitch? Like I, how did he handle that? Cause I think that's really interesting from a, like a professional pops to yep. how to handle his, his, his son. Yeah. Yeah. He, so he retired in 2000. So I would have been six. Um, so, and then he ended up doing some coaching with the tigers. Um, for about 10 years when we were growing up, but they were right across the border in Detroit. So he was able to kind of go over there for a couple hours, throw BP, do whatever he had to do. And then he was back home for our practices and games at night, my, myself, my siblings. And um, so, yeah, I would say from, from a very young age, he was the coach. Um, and again, he just did it because he, he had the time and he wanted to be involved. He didn't want to be the guy taking over. There were some other coaches on our team. He was just one of them. Um, but yeah, he was all the way up through, you know, we have this organization that goes up to you about 14, 15 years old. And then we have another organization in my area that you move to where it's kind of more elite. Uh, we have a 16U and an 18U team and Windsor selects. That's the team that you kind of get recruited out of to, to kind of, if you're trying to go to college or whatever it might be. Um, is that so yeah. like a, like a travel ball kind of thing? Or is that like a yeah. high school level? Like, can you break that down? Yeah. So in, in Canada, we don't really have competitive high school teams. Um, our competitive baseball is, is travel ball. Interesting. Um, so yeah, you just play, there's a six, like I said, 16 U and an 18 U team. So when you're in high school, yeah, you're just playing for these kind of, I guess, elite travel ball teams. Um, and we would play teams all throughout our province or for you guys state. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of how, and I was fortunate enough to be in a province, Ontario. That's pretty, uh, you know, I would say pretty well known for baseball in Canada we're probably the powerhouse of, of baseball in Canada. Um, but obviously that doesn't compare to a lot of different, you know, states that, you know, where baseball is a lot more prevalent. Yeah. So, yeah. And no, I mean, there's, 
you can't even compare the whole state of Canada to just Miami, a city. Yeah, it's, you know, it's ridiculous. I, it's it's yeah. stupid. It's crazy. Yeah. But let's let's take this as a learning opportunity, man. For because I I know that there's going to be a lot of your following that's that are going to watch this. And and let's be real, your following comes from Canada, a lot of it. So and and what you're doing with your strength and conditioning, you know, the guys you're training. What do you what what do you tell them, man? How how can they get exposure? What are your tips on that kind of stuff? Yeah. So actually, some of my clients right now are. are you know, going through that process, they're in that age group, um, you know, grade 10, grade 11 here is obviously when you start getting recruited and getting seen by these college coaches. So they're asking me, do I go to these showcases? Do I like, what do I do to get seen? Cause again, obviously in Canada, it's a little bit tougher to, to get that exposure. Um, and so, and obviously, you know, again, COVID hasn't really helped the whole process. These kids Bruh. can't really cross the, cross the border to go to these different events uh, to get scouted. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's been kind of rewarding for me because not only am I helping these kids in their skill development, I'm also helping in this, you know, recruiting process as they're trying to chase the dream that I was able to, to kind of fulfill. And so, yeah, they're, they're, I would say it's a little bit different than when we were in high school, kind of going through this process, but, yeah. um, it is nice to have somebody like myself for them to lean on. Um, you know, if some college is asking them to go to a camp and it's a thousand bucks, like, Hey, Brett, should I go to this or no? Like, so it's, it's kind of nice to have those conversations. And, and, you know, I think my biggest thing for them is I tell them to do the research. Um, if it's a school they really want to go to, Hey, it might be a, a good idea to go to the camp. Um, but in terms of going to all these showcases, perfect game, whatever it might be, again, I understand they're, they're extremely highly scouted, but it's like, there are so many events like you, you, you'll kill yourself if you're trying to, you know, go to all of them and try to get seen in all of them. Right. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And I, I mean, dude, I only went to like two events to tell yeah, you the truth. Crazy. And I mean, I wasn't a all American or anything like that. Maybe if that would have been the case, I would have gone to a lot more, Yeah. but there, the, there's a whole different side of it, which is like, do you train or do you travel? And yeah. it's like, how did your pops deal with that? How did he handle you with that? Because he knew the importance of actually practicing and fundamentals. Yeah. yeah, that's why I think it's a little bit different in Canada in terms of, you know, kind of the process you go through. I was fortunate enough in grade 11 to be selected for the uh, Team Ontario team, which is like, you know, the state would be like Team Florida or whatever gotcha. it might be. Um, and we competed in like a, a national tournament uh, all throughout Canada. And from there, I was able to be seen by the Team Canada coach um, and kind of recruited to that junior national team. And so for my whole grade 12 year, I was on that team and we went down to trips to Florida where we would play against instructional league pro teams. Um, we would go down to, then we ended up training for our world tournament at the end of the year, which was in Korea. Um, and we ended up playing against teams like the U S and Japan. And we actually played against like Otani and players like that. So in terms of being from Canada, that was a really wait, like, wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold <laughs> on, hold on. You're not just going to name drop that and not even like, hold on, hold on, hold on. You played against Otani when you guys were young. So grade 12. Yeah. Talk, give me, give me more. Was yeah. he the dude he is now? Like, was he just like, did you watch that guy? And you're like, this guy's a freak. Well, so I think we played them in the very first game of our world tournament in Korea. And I don't think our coach wanted us to know who he was to like psych ourselves out before the game. So, you know, he mentioned like, yeah, this guy throws pretty hard. Like he's going to come at you, but he was also bat and clean up for them. <laughs> and, and we're like, all right, like it's a little strange, but, and yeah, sure enough, he's throwing 94 to 96 with a white boat slider. And we actually ended up beating him uh, that, that very first game of the tournament. Um, and again, I think he might've had a hit or something too, but, uh, yeah, he was pretty impressive. And then obviously he went on to be who he is now. Yeah. Um, but and, even and you said this yeah. was 18. How old were you guys? Yeah. 18, grade 12. Gotcha. So, um, yeah. Again, again, being in Canada, that's kind of the, the top point that you can be at playing against. Again, Team USA was all for, full of first rounders, right? Like Trace, uh, Trace played for Team USA. Right? Yeah. 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 I mean, so, yeah, just kind of having that experience. That's where I got most of my exposure for pro teams, colleges coming out of high school, but for other Canadians who don't have that experience, or even, I guess, Americans who don't have the opportunity to play for the national team, which is a pretty, you know, prestigious in the States. So it's a little bit different. Um, I would say 
from where I came from being in Canada. Like if you're good in Canada, you're on the national team because Canada's smaller, right? Yeah. Uh, if you're good in the States, <laughs> you might not be on the national. No, team. I mean, I can, I, I have, I have some experience on that as well. And dude, yeah. it just kind of blew my mind right now that I, I, I just realized like, yeah, Tra- Trace was in the USA team. Um, yeah. And I didn't even talk about that with him yesterday. It's like, yeah. I've had two episodes right now with you and Trace and it's, these are national players. Like that's not yeah. a, that's not a small thing, <laughs> dude. Like you yeah. guys, um, I, when I was 16, i made the 16 U trials and I went to California and I was with Francisco Lindor and Jesse yeah. Winker and all those kind of guys. And it, it's a, I mean, kind of what you can kind of add to it. It was a huge, like eye opening moment to be like, yo, these guys are 16 and throwing 95 with four inches of sink. What the, and there's, these guys are hitting the ball 400 feet. And like, until this day, I still think Francis Golden Doors has the smoothest hands I've ever seen at 16 years old. I was like, yeah. So like that, like just wakes you up real quick of what's out there in the baseball world. Yeah, no. And I definitely thought for me, like having that experience, um, what, you know, some of the guys on my team got drafted or, or signed, and then a lot of us went to college, but I think having that experience in high school was so beneficial. Like you said, playing against guys throwing this hard and doing what they do. And then I went to college, a smaller D1 college. It's almost like I was going like down a level, right? Yeah. And, and I'm only 18 years old playing against guys that are four years older than me. So it was definitely a, a, a cool experience. And I think that's the whole point. And, and I, I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to play for that national team and, and have that opportunity to um, be exposed to those players at that age, because I think everything after that, you know, throughout my collegiate career and then into pro bowl, it's like, I already ha- had that prior experience that made me more comfortable in those situations. Um, it wasn't like, you know, when I went to college and I'm facing a guy throwing 92, it's like, all right, I've seen this before, you know? And I think that helped me get off to a good start throughout my uh, college career. And then ultimately helped me get into pro ball. I mean, and you didn't even talk about the like fans and the pressure and all of that. Like when you're playing for your country, you know, when yeah. you're playing, like, I mean, what was, what do you think the biggest crowd that you played in when you, cause you said you in Tokyo? Uh, we were Korea. in Korea, 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 Seoul. Korea, my bad. Yeah. That you're playing uh, around, what? 10, 15,000 people. Yeah. I don't, I think it was probably around 10. And again, like when you're over there, there's, there's not, like we don't have a Canadian crowd or there wasn't a U.S. crowd, like it's all Koreans. Right. And so uh, we didn't even get to play against Korea. I don't think in that tournament. So we didn't have the exposure of being against like the home crowd. And Uh, that would have been raw. Yeah. But we did. Yeah. Obviously some of the bigger games or even like we were in the finals against us, like it was still packed. Like people are there to watch. Right. And so, yeah, it was like you said, having that experience playing against in front of a crowd um, going into college and playing against like, in front of a thousand people it's like oh whatever you know and it's like having that familiarity definitely definitely helps you in those high pressure pressure situations absolutely absolutely so we're gonna take a little quick break right here and we're gonna ask you the first question from the audience that we had today yep. um if you have three exercises for position players go you can only give me three three okay you can give me less but you can't give me more yeah no i'll preface it by saying i, I train a lot of my pitchers and position players like similarly um but if I go three that I think are essential, I'll go one power, one upper, one lower. How's that sound? Okay. 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 Notice this is the second guy we've had strength and conditioning, and he does not bring up exercises. He brings up categories because yeah. exercises are not so important. It's the categories. It's what we're trying to do. You want to exactly. add on that? So, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I mean, I'll give you an example of each. Um, for power, I like the single arm dumbbell snatch. I think it's I think it's awesome for developing power. For lower, I like the single leg deadlift, uh, either barbell or dumbbell. Uh, and for upper, loaded chin up. I don't think you can go wrong. Very very simple, loaded up three to five reps. That's how you build some some upper body strength right there. Absolutely, absolutely. I know, and I will use this as our our beautiful transition. I know you're huge on stability, balance, yeah. coordination why and kind of just go off yeah so i think uh you know i think in in today's world a lot of people are looking for answers in the athletic world people are looking for the perfect uh program the perfect exercise how can i make myself the best with this perfect recipe and it's like it's really not rocket science you know it's very simple but you just need to do the simple things consistently 
And that's why I kind of mentioned, like you said, stability, balance, um, strength, all of these things. I try to incorporate my exercises to have all of these components uh, together. You know, if you think about doing a bench press, okay, what's that do? All it works on is strength, right? Or hypertrophy or whatever you're, whatever you're trying to build. But like, there's no stability aspect there. There's no core. There's no, you know what I mean? Whereas yes. if you add in, again, let's use that example, bench press, let's go a single arm bench press with your feet elevated. All right. All of a sudden you, you knock in the core there and that just adds an element. You know, you're not really changing the muscles that you're working in terms of your upper body, but you're adding core. You're adding, you need, you need to stabilize your, you know, your lumbar spine into the ground or the bench, whatever it might be. So anytime that you can kind of add those components, it's like you're, you're knocking out more, um, with the exercise. And so you don't need to do your core after if you've already incorporated, yes. you know what I mean? Um, which because is, which what, is for me, yeah. I'll say what, what is the biggest limiting reagent we have is time, right? You know, you yeah. got to hit for this amount of time. You got to feel for this amount of time. You got to yeah. incorporate your strength and conditioning. It's finding out ways to put everything together, right? Yeah. No. And, and again, I'll, I'll kind of backtrack and say, listen, if you're a beginner and and you need to develop a foundation before you have access to do these sort of things, right? You can't be doing something that requires extreme stability if you don't have any sort of base. Now, if we're talking about somebody like yourself or myself, or even some high school kids that are pretty athletic, like they, they could probably handle um, some of these different kind of aspects that we're, that we're involving. Like you said, stability, balance, but like you need to have that base level of strength before you can do anything. Um, absolutely and any i would even throw it back at you don't train for two three don't train for a month and go do your single leg kettlebell no. squat no shot you're going to do that so it's no. it's building on it and i also want to say the game of baseball a lot of it is played on one leg people don't realize that yeah you're transitioning from one 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 leg to the other leg when you're throwing your swing is you're trying to keep both feet planted but kinetic movement forward you're getting off of one leg so yeah. everything is training that way. So go ahead. Yeah, no. And, and it's funny that you should mention that because a large part of my training is single leg exercises for the lower body. Um, honestly, I rarely program uh, two leg exercises. Yeah, I'll mix in like a trap bar deadlift here and, uh, you know, here and now. I'm not a huge barbell back squat fan. Um, Why? I do, um, a number of reasons. So again, I'm a big uh, Eric Cressy follower. Um, huge guy. I mean, I think he's probably the number one in the industry anyway, but uh, his big things are the, the, the position that it puts the shoulder in. Um, when you have to hold the bar like that, your, your shoulders are externally rotating. And as, as throwers, that's what we do, right? We externally rotate to throw. So you're almost like adding to that negative effect um, on your shoulder. And which make, again, it's not a guaranteed injury, but it, you're making yourself more prone to injury. Um, whereas you can accomplish the same goal. So if you're, if your goal with that barbell back squat is to develop, you know, lower body strength. Okay. How about you do a, you know, an RFE split squat or a Bulgarian split squat with more than half the weight. And you're actually getting a, a more of an impact on that than the actual barbell back squat. You know what I'm saying? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I definitely yeah. agree on that. And I, and I want to kind of shift a little bit, but not yeah. too far on what you just kind of talked about. Where does, because we're talking about um, the position we put ourselves in our shoulder and this and that, how do we kind of talk a little bit about mobility and flexibility? And let's keep it at the shoulder side, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and for me, I, I really specifically think about the front squat, yeah. you know, because like, or the cleans and getting that elbow up. Like I can't, till this day, I can never do it. Like I don't yeah. have the flexibility. So how do you, when you're training your guys, how do you kind of work on incorporating that mobility side or limiting the strength side? Like, how do you play with that? Yeah, it's a great question. I think like you mentioned, time is, is our kind of biggest thing here. You, you know, you can't spend three hours in the weight room or most people can't. Um, and so if you have a problem getting to say that front squat position, like you mentioned, instead of spending an hour trying to, to, you know, get your body to be able to do that, it's like, all right, how will we just substitute something? You know, we have safety bars now. Why don't we use that where you don't need any sort of mobility? And I understand the mobility part of it is huge, but if you're going to kill yourself trying to get to that position just to maybe improve it a little bit, yeah, we can work on that lat mobility, shoulder mobility, but like, let's just do something that's 
you know, can accomplish the same goal in a more easy way, if that makes sense. And, um, and I'll also add to that, it's we can continuously try to, you know, get better at that. So if we yeah, know that our yeah. lap mobility is not there, we can work on, you know, maybe five minutes every couple of days on our lap mobility, but we can still use the safety bar, use yeah. this and that to continuously get stronger at those other things. So we're not wasting that time, which I think is what you're trying to get at. Exactly, exactly. Like you can slowly, progressively get better with that mobility by doing say one or two exercises a day, but you don't need to spend three weeks trying to work on that shoulder mobility or lat mobility and then not even squat because you're trying to focus on that too much. So yeah, I think that's, that's a great point. Um, but definitely in terms of the, the mobility and the, um, that kind of work, I like to incorporate that stuff as like an active rest, uh, sort of, sort of ideal in my training. Ooh. So instead of doing your set of let's just say squats or lunges instead of doing your set of lunges and then sitting there for two minutes while you wait to to do your next set you could be doing a 90 90 uh hip mobility on the ground right it's not going to take a lot out of you but it's going to be pretty beneficial so instead of just sitting down or standing there and waiting i love supersets so i love again we can get into this but i love doing yes say the lunges with some sort of plyometric with a core, but then if you're still waiting, you, you like use that time to do something active recovery, do some mobility, do some something to be productive. You shouldn't be in the gym for more than an hour. If, if you're doing everything properly, right? Like you, and have it all that. depends on your goal. Like we're talking exactly. about baseball here. We're talking yeah, about yeah, baseball. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, the thing is, like you said, people are busy. First of all, Second of all, your body's going to start fatiguing after that 60, 70 minute range anyway. So if we're trying to jam everything into 60 minutes, we need to make the most of that time. We can't be sitting around for half that time waiting to do our working sets, right? And which is why, again, this structure of what you do is extremely important in fitting those things in. Bro, you're, 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 you're preaching right now. I love yeah. everything you're saying right now. So we're going to take a second, second little break and talk about the next question. <clears throat> The next question for you, and it was, I mean, you kind of hit it a little bit, so I'm not going to throw it. It was to, uh, top three for pitchers, but you kind of gave me that. So I'm going to throw a different one at you saying top three exercises for speed and agility. So I, I love the 5 10 five, uh, kind of that football agility. Um, again, when we talk about athletics and, and training, a lot of sports have uh, parallels and, and overlaps with them. I think the five ten five is huge for for that kind of stopping and starting, D cell and X cell, and that that can play in any sport. So yes. I, I love that. Um, I'll, I'm also a big proponent. If you want to get faster, sprint. Like it's it's plain and simple. Sprint and time your sprints. Um, you need to hold yourself accountable. So I love the push up start. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's huge for acceleration. And again, when I'm talking about sprinting, I'm talking about like 10, 20, 30 yards. Like any sport that you're talking about speed is okay. It's one thing, but you need to be able to accelerate when you're a bit, let's talk baseball. You're running from home to first. It's not about how fast you are. It's about how fast can you accelerate from zero to get to your top speed, right? Uh -huh. The fastest uh -huh. guys can accelerate the fastest. So push up starts again, getting your feet underneath you as quickly as possible, accelerate out. Um, so I would say that's number two. The third one for me, working on that agility is plyometrics. Um, I'm a huge fan of single leg plyometrics, like hops, jumps, um, lateral, linear, whatever it might be, being able to absorb force and then drive out and kind of push off the ground. Um, that is going to help you become more explosive. And again, all of these things, when we talk about them, make you a better athlete and better athletes move faster. They're stronger. You know what I mean? So um, again, these things aren't like, these genius drills, right? Everybody's heard of them, but if you do them properly and you do them quickly, like that's how you're going to really build that speed and, and agility. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, we've all heard the cliche, the baseball game is a game of inches, right? So yeah. being able to train like that and being able to be, if we could get a little bit more explosive, maybe we can get to that ball. Maybe we yep. can take that extra step. And that's kind of all we're training for. If we consistently do that little by little by little, we get an extra hit here, an extra there. And you know, we, we might, we might win a ball game, that changes your career. People don't yeah. realize like the, the attention to detail that you need to have to be a professional. Like when you've, I mean, if you want to, if you want to kind of name drop or just kind of think about like the guys that you were around and you were like, bro, these guys take this, like, this is, yeah, it's their job, but no, this is their 
job like these guys are not playing around like yeah. any any special like memories or things like that that you can think about well i was gonna say even i mean i know you know but just for the people listening like the guys that we played against or with in pro ball were they better than us skill wise maybe maybe a few like if you talk about like a vladimir guerrero jr yeah sure like okay he has more pop than us but like if you talk about the the average big leaguer right the average good big leaguer do, are their skill sets better than any other pro ball player probably not they just do things more consistently they do things maybe a little bit better but that little bit better is because they're they're more attentive to that detail right it's not like you're on a playing field where you feel overmatched right um yeah it's like it's just like man this guy's not that much better but he is like why because he does these little things like you mentioned better and that might be you know, skill wise, or it might be that the athleticism wise, he might be a little bit faster because he pays more attention to detail to his acceleration work. Right. And I think that's the biggest thing for me, like being on a field with, with all of these guys. And you're like, now I look back and they're all big leaguers. And I'm like, wait, how are they big leaguers? They weren't better than me, but like they were they're, They do those little things better that make them an overall better player and more consistent player. Dude. I'm gonna, there's two ways we're going to take that conversation. But the first yeah. one I was going to say is, does that make the game harder to, to leave it? Or when the game gets taken away from you, you're like, bro, that guy's not that better, that much better than me. Like, how do you deal with that? A little bit, yeah. I mean, and again, it's easy to look back and be like, oh, I should be there. I should be doing this. But really, like, based on my performance, no, like, I came to the end of the road. I didn't perform. And that's that's the way it goes. Should I have gotten another opportunity? Yeah, maybe. maybe but maybe like, not. that's the way it goes, right? And but I look, yeah, I look at the guys that say have made it or are doing it. It's like, yeah, they are, they performed when they needed to perform. Yeah. They got a couple more opportunities there and there. Maybe. Yeah. They're a higher draft pick maybe, but they found a way to do things a little bit better, a little bit more consistent. And that's what teams look for, right? They want consistency. They don't want a guy who can flashy do something once in a while. It's like, you need the guy that comes to the field day in, day out and can perform for you. If you know you're getting 260 with an 800 OPS, 750 OPS, like, yeah, I'll take that. Good defense, good base runner. Like, you don't need to have a 900 OPS with 40 bombs. Like, you know, they, and that's what I think I, you know, when I was playing, I thought that's what I had to do. Um, but really, as you go from one level to the next, you just need to be consistent and you need to be consistently good. You can't have those slip ups, right? Yeah, they need to know what they're what they're having. They yeah. you know, the manager is making making the lineup, and he, he in his in his brain he already kind of has done a scout report on the other on the other arm on the other on the other position guys on the other team. So he's trying to build his game plan, and he's to know okay, you know, Brett is going to do this for me today because that's kind of what he does. So he's yeah. not they're they're not gambling. They're they're creating no. plans. Everything is planned out, and that's what we don't you know people don't realize. Yeah. So. I will also kind of add on that. So consistency, all this kind of stuff, routine. Talk to me about routine, bro, because I mean. Yeah, I think routine is such a, such a fascinating thing because everybody has a different one. And, and so important. Yes. And I think, you know, younger players, high school players, even younger than that, they might think like these guys are in there grinding for, for hours, right? Doing their routine. And like the, some guys are, but like some guys don't need to be. And that can be perceived as like, oh, they're not working very hard. But I found that the guys that I played with or against that were the best or had the best routines were the guys that knew exactly what they needed to do. And that might be going into the cage for 10 minutes, doing a couple off the tee, a couple flips, and that's it. That was their day, right? That's their preparation. Everybody knows it's a long season with baseball, right? Like college, minor leagues, major leagues. Like if you're grinding for hours a day, you're going to grind your body down. You need to find the best way to get your body and, and skills ready for the game without spending an hour on it. Right. Um, and again, some guys are more, I would say more uh, extensive than others, but, but that everybody that is good that I've played against or with had a set routine every single day and they didn't stray from it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I kind of keep throwing it back at you. Pops, did yep. he teach you routine? When when did you learn the importance of it and how did that go for you? Yeah, I look back at it now and like even in, I would say before high school, like when I'd go hit off the tee or do whatever, like I had a set, I guess, routine that I did and I didn't realize it at the time. It's just like what I did, right? It must have been from, 
you know, what being able to watch big leaguers from a young age, being able to pick his brain, but having that, okay, I'm going to do one hand for a couple other hand for a couple inside, outside, up, down, whatever it might be on off, off the tee or flips or whatever it was. Um, I was able to have that consistent routine. So when I was going to play with my, you know, 14 year old, whatever it was game, I knew I was ready for it. And again, routines at each level are different because you have access to different resources. And if I have a cage by my house, okay, I can do what I can there. Or if we're not hitting BP before the game, what's your routine to still get you ready for the game if you're not hitting on the field before the game, right? Like everything changes. You need to have different routines for different circumstances. But I think prep that all boils down to being how prepared you are for the game and, and routine is, is huge in that. Absolutely. And I, and I want to kind of allow you to continue on that sense. When did you figure out like, okay, we, we already acknowledge that routines are important. Now at what point or how can you kind of help these young guys out there figure out not yeah, We got routines important. Now, why am I doing this? So if I'm hitting at the beginning of my drill, a ball outside and I'm letting it travel, is it because I struggle with the outside pitch or is it because I need to feel my hips clearing or whatever it may be? How was it for you? Like what moment did you're like, okay, this is my routine, but it's not just my routine. It's because of X, Y, and Z. Yeah. I think that, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head there. A routine is established to address your weaknesses. Number one, um, continue developing your strengths. Number two, but if you can't identify what you struggle with, then you're not going to be able to work on it. And I think a routine because you do it every day, it slowly helps you get out of those bad habits or weaknesses that, that you might have. Um, for me, again, as a guy, say my hands dropped. Well, I did drills every single day to kind of combat that and kind of have my hands not drop, right? And so I think you need to identify as, as an individual player, what are your weaknesses? Okay, what drills do I need to do to get away from those weaknesses? And then obviously, what do I need to do to continue to, to develop my strengths? And that's Again, I think that's what a routine really should encompass. Dude, I mean, that's, I, I'm like literally thinking right now, I got to bring in a routine expert because, dude, it's so important. Whether it's every facet of life, whether it's yeah. kind of, I mean, I'm sure there has to be somebody out there that just kind of focuses on on helping people do that. Yeah. Whether it's baseball, whether it's life, whether it's business, whether it's, you know, anything. I mean, for yeah. bro, even from like medical school, all that kind of stuff is so, so, so important. Yeah. But let's, let's take a little quick shift. Um, You've been doing some strength and conditioning stuff for about how long now? So I was huge into it when I was playing. Um, and then when I finished playing, I actually got my CSCS certification. Good for you. And I've been training people for probably about a year. Okay, um, perfect. So then I can, I can yeah. act, maybe ask you this. I feel like you might have had some experience on it. Yeah. Um, Because we're going to talk a little bit later and make sure you stay tuned because we're going to be talking about how strength and conditioning and the, you know the gym a changed the player you were which is dealt one of the main things about this this episode with you but yeah. i want to kind of hit like as a strength coach how do you kind of deal with quote unquote lazy players and then i'll give you another layer so you can kind of intertwine it all are lazy players because they're lazy or because they don't see the importance of the strength and conditioning side yeah absolutely uh, and again i think where i'm coming from i I, I train a lot of guys privately, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, small group. So they're coming to me because they want to get better. Um, I think it's different if you're hired on by a team and you need to work with the whole team and it's like some guys don't want to be there. Um, I've been fortunate to be able to work with players who have actively sought me out because they want to get better. And that's and so, so exciting. I, that's so no, exciting. It's awesome, man. I don't have to deal with that. Like you said, the laziness, because you know if you're coming to me, paying me to train you, you're, you're going to be putting in the work. Right. And I think that's the, the biggest thing that I've enjoyed is I haven't had to deal with that, that laziness. Right. Um, but again, usually I, like probably like holding them back. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Relax, relax. Like, yeah, trust the I'm process. Like, I'm like, dude, like, yeah, no, exactly. But like, it's nice to be able to have that. Um, uh, again, if I had a team where I needed to deal with some kids that were lazy, it's like, I would, you know, tell them that message. If you don't want to be here, if you don't want to put in the work, like it's not going to affect me. It's going to affect you. It's going to affect your teammates when you don't perform as well as you're supposed to be performing. And again, that's ultimately on them. And I think that's an accountability thing. I think 
if you instill that in the players from, from the beginning, then they kind of get out of those bad habits. And then it's not even an option not to work hard or, or put in the work. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I've had a couple of different, uh, conversations with the people and it was just kind of, there's depending on what type of player you are. Um, if you're, you're just a guy who just rakes, just flat out rakes and you see the importance of hitting and that's all you do. And they don't really understand that sometimes, you know, being in the gym, working on rotational work, working on strength work is kind of help you hit the ball further. Yeah. And whether it's knowledge, education or whatnot, like some guys don't get that. So it's like, it's an interesting dynamic to figure out why a player is lazy. Is it because he, and that's like a, that's, it sounds simple, but it's, it's the psychology of a coach, you know, yeah. is it this guy's lazy because he doesn't really care about the game. He's playing the game for his pops. Or is it because he really doesn't value this? And he's like in his brain taking swings while he's doing reps at the gym, you know? So that's yeah. an interesting dynamic. Yeah. I definitely think too, like some guys that I've played with or against, they're just so naturally talented. You know, you could say it, God give whatever from a young age, they were the best and they continue to be the best till it catches up. Yeah. And again, like some guys, they can ride that out to the big leagues. Some guys, they can ride it out to, they get drafted, whatever it might be. But like, I think the biggest part, so I, I think, again, if you're gifted skill-wise, you don't need to work that hard in the weight room, right? Because all these guys are trying to get bigger, faster, stronger to like catch up to you. But I would say it catches up to you at a certain age, but then it also catches up to you uh, injury-wise, um, if you don't take care of your body in the weight room, it's not just to get bigger, faster, stronger, to perform better. It's to get your body more resilient to injury. Um, and again, I think baseball is so unique because we play so many games that your body is going to wear down. Whatever yes. position you play, your body is going to wear down. The work you put in in the off season and then also in season to maintain that strength, maintain what you built, that's going to keep you on the field. And I think that's what people don't realize until they're, you know, in the training room and, and hurt. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I posted a video either yesterday or the day before about like hip mobility. And in that, in the caption I wrote, it's for, if you're a catcher and your work, you need to incorporate hip mobility to receive this, this but for your career's longevity, because yeah. you don't realize like if you're stiff and you're tight, whether you're in catcher, middle infield or anything like that, and you're not loose, your muscles are taking a beating consistently. And that's kind of what you're talking about. This, the strength and this, all this aspect is not just for performing, but about not killing your body. So, I mean, yep. that's, that's so spot on. Let's, let's kind of address a little bit and then we'll, we'll, we'll get to um, your story with strength and stuff. How with you, when you, know, you play for so many years, how did you keep your body feeling good, man? I mean, I was a guy that, that needed to be in the weight room. And again, this can really, you, you got after it. You got after it. Yeah, like yeah. I'm not, it's, bro, this guy, like I'll never forget. I remember this till the day. Like I can I close my eyes and see, still see it. I, I first started to do glue, um, the thrust, uh, hip thrust, hip thrust, hip thrust with the A's. That was the first time I ever did it. I remember showing up there and homeboy here, I think he was had like five plates on each side, just repping it. Boom, boom, boom. I was like, <laughs> And I'm like, I always used to think I was strong. And I used, I looked at him. I was like, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> and this was like right before a game. Like right after, like he was, he worked, he worked. So go ahead. No. And, I, and again, I can, we can relate back this in a minute as we talked about, you know, my strength and conditioning kind of journey. But um, I was a guy when I played, I needed to almost feel not tight, but like I needed to be like full. And so I needed to be in the weight room and, and whether it was before a game, after a game, like I needed to be constantly strong. And when I didn't feel strong, I felt, you know, susceptible to injury. And I also felt like I just, I couldn't perform. And so I guess it was a good thing in that regard because it motivated me, me to be in the weight room. Um, but yeah, that's just the way I was. I, I, from a young age, like I needed that feeling or else I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't play. You know, what's interesting. And I, and I just wrote it down. It was like, for me, and I, and I feel like you might've been the same. I want to see why but maybe it wasn't, but I always needed my Jersey to be tight and it yeah. wasn't about the ego side. It was, I needed to feel strong. I needed to feel sore. And my confidence was through the roof. And I was like, all right, let's go. Like, yeah. I'm a, I'm a, no matter what you're throwing, you're throwing 98. Let's go. I, yeah. Cause I know you, you always look big. Like you, you, and you, you filled out every Jersey you had and all that kind of stuff. So 
was there a psyche to that or it was just kind oh. of that's how things fit no absolutely and and like you mentioned those kind of things i think big for me too like having my legs feeling like strong so when i stepped in the box like i felt grounded mm. um i think sometimes yeah if i felt weak or i felt it was like i had no base i had and it's just like i couldn't do anything and so i needed to have that like not be sore but like just a little bit of just tight okay. just a little bit of tightness to be like damn like, there's a pump there yeah and again it, it's it is a balance because yeah if you overwork yourself and you're tired for the game yeah it's going to catch up with you and I, I was there a time or two but i also would rather that than be like feeling weak or feeling like i was deflated right um absolutely and, I, and I, yeah. again I, i'll add to it, this all is independent of the player yeah like, i'm sure yeah. if we bring in um damn was billy 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 him, him yeah you know what, what's his name what's his name the super fast guy with um billy hamilton yeah billy Hamilton. there i just wasn't sure if it was yeah, yeah. billy hamilton he's gonna be like nah i need to feel quick i need to feel yeah. agile like maybe, yeah. maybe that's his thing it depends what type of game you are yeah. um so it's just figuring out what because confidence i mean especially in the game of baseball man if you ain't got yeah. no confidence you, you you ain't hitting you ain't doing anything so yeah. figuring that out consistently exactly yeah no and again everybody's different but i think you need to know what you need to do but everybody needs a, a degree of it right you can't just be like oh i feel better when i don't work out all season it's like all right you need you know you need to be in the gym at some point but you just need to have that balance to to perform well too absolutely absolutely so let's let's finally get to the, to meat and potatoes here um your career with strength training i mean you were been big since i've ever known you and i'm pretty sure you were big before that how yeah. has strength up impacted your career so uh, yeah i think kind of dating back i think it started in high school um i didn't get in the weight room heavy until probably grade 11 ish grade 12 yeah grade 11 and i think for me coming out of high school especially and this relates back to being from canada again i wasn't the guy with the best arm didn't have the best swing and wasn't the fastest guy so yeah, you you really weren't a smooth guy no you no. like till even through pro ball like your swing was not smooth smooth like no. it was just the ball just carried off your back no and again i think and again people would say like oh maybe you're just too tight because you're too big but like even before i was big like my swing was not smooth growing up right so i think subconsciously i i, I told myself okay coming from canada i'm going to go to these events these showcases whatever it might be how am I going to separate myself from my, all the other players in my class? And that was my body. Like I was going to show up and be the biggest, strongest guy there. So scouts, coaches, whoever might be watching me would be like, wow, like this guy stands out to me. Cause that, that was kind of my ticket. Right. And I think when I first started training, I, I was that bodybuilder type, Hey, I'm just trying to get as big as possible. And man, honestly, yeah, I looked good. I was, definitely one of the biggest guys in terms of mus muscle tone and everything. And was I working out properly? No, but it was probably better than doing nothing. 100%. And so that carried me into college, you know, got me recognized for the team Canada in high school, all of that got recruited to college, still had some raw ability. Again, nothing was really smooth. I could hit balls hard and far because I was big and strong. Mechanics probably weren't very good. Throwing, I was okay, but like, Again, it wasn't holding me back being big, but it also wasn't like helping me the way it should. Um, went to college and in the Northeast, this is kind of a known thing, but you know, teams are just huge. They're big. And my strength trainer, strength coach at college was a big like, hey, let's squat, bench, deadlift, heavy as possible. Whole I think our whole team could bench over 300 pounds. Like it was ridiculous. Like it was, yeah, we were huge. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, we were huge. But like, and, I, and again, I was probably middle of the pack. So take that into consideration. We had some big dudes on our team. Yeah. And um, again, you get, I mean, if you're watching this, you, I, I, I mean, you still look pretty big these days, but you don't really understand till you see the, like the way he was pulling out, you know, the way he was moving, like, yeah. like that's what it's, Yeah. Well, like becomes an obsession, right? And and you get, like you said, into that routine. And then for me, it was normal. For me, it was like, this is what I do every day, you know? And so I think, yeah, in college, those, those habits definitely um, started to form. But it wasn't until I got into pro ball where I started to realize, I would say even like 
two years in a pro ball. Uh, some of the guys that we had, Matty Rutt was a big influence on me. Um, yeah. They kind of taught me that, okay, you can be big and strong, but you got to be able to move well too. And that's when I really started getting into, I would say the functional training um, kind of avenue. And that really helped me in terms of getting my body to feel better. Um, I definitely thought I was performing better with, with those movements and with what I was doing. Yeah, I was big and strong, but now I could actually like move and, and have it translate to the baseball field. Um, and then now as I'm a you know, strength coach and trainer, it's like I'm trying to instill those, those kind of attitudes in my kids, in my clients as they're moving along the ladder. Because if I knew the things that I know now back when I was in high school, you know, I'd be able to, to train a little bit smarter uh, and not as, you know, meatheadish. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we can even kind of throw it a little bit. Like, let's talk about Tatis Jr., bro. Like, yeah, he's a freak of nature. Yeah. But you don't think that guy's been training a specific way since he was 10 years old yeah. with rotational movement stability, like all that kind like, bro, like, yeah, he's a freak, but there's a reason why these juniors become, you know, who they become. Yeah. yeah and I think, no, it's definitely some, yeah, definitely having some ability being around the game, but it's also, yeah, training in a way, um, doing things in a way that are going to benefit you. Um, and again, not all of these movements need to be like baseball specific or hockey, whatever sport you're playing. Yeah. Don't overdo it. No, but there are certain things that are going to help. Like, Hey, if you're a pitcher or thrower, like, and you're doing some arm care stuff, probably going to help. Right. Um, like we just mentioned baseball player and you're, barbell benching or back squatting like yeah probably not the best for your shoulder and there's other things you can do for it but i think yeah like you said the rotational movements certain things that are going to actually help you on the baseball field if you start doing those at a younger age those are going to benefit you down the line no absolutely and like yeah you talked about the benching press you you know maybe you don't have to bench bench press you still have to work out your chest because you're going to cause instabilities but like you yeah. said, you know, maybe your legs up or maybe doing it on a plyo ball or working on single arm, all of that stuff. We have to continuously build strength. It's just risk versus reward versus balance kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and like you mentioned, it's you need to be strong in every aspect of your body. Like that's how you're going to bulletproof your body against injury. But there are there are smarter ways to do certain things like, OK, upper body strength instead of doing like you said, bench press do a landmine press. Like then you're actually moving your scap in the way that it moves in the game, but you're still yes. building strength instead of doing a back squat, do a RFE split squat or do a front squat, do something that's going to still give you that lower body strength, but it's going to not take away from that, that upper body mobility or put your shoulder in a position where a vulnerable position, right? No, absolutely. Absolutely. And you talked a little bit about injuries there. Let's talk about your career. Did you deal with injuries, especially coming from the meathead aspect? So it's kind of funny. I I mean, knock on wood, but yeah, I've never had a major injury in my career. And that's awesome, dude. Yeah. I attribute that a lot to the way that I handled my, my body. And again, even though that I was that kind of meathead, big, strong, I think having that was better than having nothing and kind of always being strong. I think it helped me keep my body away from those injuries and again i understand freak accidents happen right like you twist your ankle you pull your hamstring like all those things but i think if you're strong enough in certain areas like i don't know if you remember even with the a's they always talked about like guys pulling hammies like if you're pulling hammies it's probably because your hammies are weak like yes 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 it's not because you're tight it's because they're weak and that's why they're so big on like posterior exercises like that, like RDLs and all that to keep those hamstrings strong because like, again, certain things you can avoid, but I think certain things you can reduce the risk like significantly if you're, if you're just stronger in those areas. Right. You know what I also find very interesting is how did you learn to look, to listen to your body? Because I will say that it was my, my, my downfall in my whole career. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, it's, it's day to day. Right. And, and some days you're just not going to feel it. Well, let's take, let's take back, like, let's take steps back high school, early college. How did you learn it there? Because pro ball, like you said, once you kind of started talking with Matt and kind of, that was a different phase. So then you can kind of work your way into that. But early on, 
did you listen to it or did you just get lucky or how did that go about? I think high school, you're kind of on your own program, right? Because you're doing your own thing. College, it was a little bit different because you're kind of not forced, but like, hey, team lift, like you're going, right? Yeah. And you have no choice. So I think it's a little bit harder to do it there. Mind you, you're younger. You're probably feeling a little bit better day to day. As you get into pro ball, it's like, okay, some of these things start catching up with you. Like you said, you don't feel good when you wake up one day. Well, maybe that's not the day when you have your max effort strength day or whatever it might be. You're trying to maximize what you can do with your time. So like why waste your time doing something, you know, half-ass if it's not going to benefit you. Um, So I think, yeah, as I moved along, got older in my pro career, I was able to kind of listen to my body more and like, Hey, if I was, if I had a scheduled lift that day, it's not like, Oh, you need to get it in no matter what. It's like, okay, if I don't do it today because I don't feel well, well, I better get it in tomorrow. Like it's not, I'm not saying you push it off and don't do it, but you need to kind of maximize those specific training sessions to when you feeling your best, because you want to maximize what you're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's kind of why, so in my brain, what, what I was thinking was, for example, we talked about the hamstrings, you know, five minutes ago. And for me, I, I popped my hamstring, um, my senior year of high school and I popped it right before going to the Connie Mac world series with the legends. It was a great, you know, big, big organization here. Not sure if you would know them, but yeah. yeah. Uh, um, I mean, Manny Machado, Albert Amoro, all these huge guys out of Miami, that's where they played. So, yeah. and I will completely a thousand percent say I did not pull my hamstrings because they were weak. I pulled my hamstrings because right before the game, I was RDL uh, RDLs 315. So they were tired. So, so they were tired. So yeah. it's like, and, and, the, and it's, this is the, the interesting part. Every injury that I've, and I've had a lot of injuries, and that's probably why I'm in the sports medicine world and in the fitness world and all that because yep. I don't want kids to deal with it. But I, knew it was going to happen. I knew I was going to pull my hamstring, but I didn't pull myself out of the game. And I was like, nah, you're just being a little, yeah, get over yeah. it. And it's like, how do you learn how to deal? Like, listen to your body. Be like, nah, man, you're not. It's like categorizing yourself, like knowing, hey, you're a hardworking kid. You're not pulling yourself out or you're not doing this because you're lazy. You're doing this because like something's wrong. Any, any, Anything you want to add to that? Yeah, man, be smart, right? I think that's a huge part of it. Um, and I can even relate that to, to some skill work that I work on with guys right now. Like, you know, guys think it's the younger kind of male ego, right? Like you need to be the hardest worker in the room. You need to spend the, the most time there, but you know, quantity is not always, always king here. And I think that's what you need to realize. And like you said, you need to be smart about it. Like if you know, you're going to get hurt why are you going to put yourself through that? Like it just throws you back so much. Like if you pop my, for me, I popped my hand. It took me six months to get back. What could just, I have if I would have taken a week off and kind of built that back up? Like, bro, it's just dumb. Yeah. And, and like, again, if you're training and whether it's in the weight room or on the baseball field, whatever it is, and you're taking a thousand ground balls, like, are you even creating good habits after the first 500? Like probably not. If you're taking swings and you're just getting frustrated, like, is it helping you long-term? No. And again, to your degree, you get hurt and you're out for six months. That's even more severe. But like in terms of your development, yeah, anything you're doing, if it's not making you better, like why are you doing it? Right. Yeah. And, absolutely. and if it's not keeping you healthy, it's definitely not making you better. Right. So. Dude, I mean, that's, that's gold. That's gold. Yeah. That's gold. I want to talk a little bit about the nutrition side of stuff. Yeah. Um, how much, and then kind of we'll work through your career as well. How much did you focus on nutrition, eating, supplementation, all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, yeah, go off. Yeah. I mean, I was always a healthy eater growing up. Um, you know, I, I credit my parents to that. My mom and dad were, were big at, at home cooking and, and keeping things healthy and, and natural. Uh, Again, we weren't on some strict diet by any means, but it was just like everything in moderation, Um, just kind of eat, you know, eat, eat clean. Everybody was pretty healthy and athletic in my family, which is awesome. Um, Yeah. As I moved into college, it's a little bit tougher, right? You're on a budget, you're eating in the cafeteria. So I was more so again, when I was in my meathead stage, eat as much as possible, try to gain as much weight as possible. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, Taking mass gainers and all that kind of stuff you think you need to be huge. Right. And it's like, all right. 
so yeah, I went through that too, but it, it is overrated, like being that big, right? I mean, I was probably 220 pounds, but like, was it helping me? No. Um, but then, yeah, as I moved into, I would say the end of the college and pro ball, I started to be a little bit more cognizant of what I was eating in terms of like, okay, I need energy for the game. Like, how am I going to strategically eat throughout the day to maximize my energy? Because if not, you're doing smell and salts and drinking energy drinks before the game. Like, it's like, I didn't want to put that stuff in my body. So it was more so like, how can I maximize? I Again, I think this is like listening to your body. Like you mentioned earlier, if you know that you need to eat right before the game to give yourself energy, do it. If you know you can't eat within two hours because you're going to get cramps or something, don't do it, right? It's like, it's kind of trial and error in that regard. And I think when you play so many games, you can kind of experiment with it. And I found a routine that I liked. I needed a protein bar like mid game. I needed a fruit before the, like whatever it might be for you, get into that routine and try to stick to it. Right. I love that. I love that. I love that. How were you able to track that? Or did you ever kind of like document your process and be like, okay, this worked, this didn't work. Okay. Or, or are you an analytical guy? Like how did, how did that process go for you? So I didn't need to track food specifically. Like I didn't need to be like, oh, I'm having 3000 calories today. Like I didn't need to do that. Um, but it was more so again, routine. Like if I knew my body feel, felt good for a week or two, whatever it might be, I'm going to have the same thing for breakfast every day. Like why would I change it up? Right. Um, and again, I think it's tough college pro you're on the road like hey man like the best food options aren't always there right but you need to try to accommodate the best that you can to be the closest to 100 percent that you can and so i think always going to you know the grocery store to have protein bars apples oranges whatever it might be and i know a lot of these things were in the stadiums and stuff too but like if i knew i liked a specific something like i made sure i wasn't going to the game hungry because then i'd be really tired and then I wouldn't be able to perform the way I could perform. So it's almost like that's a huge aspect, right? If you're not feeling your best, it's you're not going to be able to perform the way you you prepared yourself for. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many, again, there's so many different avenues we can take that, whether it's, you know, mentality. Are you like in the outfield thinking about, damn, my stomach is growling. I'm hungry, <laughs> this and that. And boom, there goes a pitch and you, you know, are you're not locked in. We can yeah. talk about the actual mental side of like how your brain works. If you go on keto and you're not actually strength, like it's not, you know, up to date. And we're working talking about milla, milliseconds that's making a difference. Yeah. So it's so many different avenues. And I also, we can also even go into kind of talking about, dude, get your protein bars get this there like it's actually cheaper if you do that than if you go eat mcdonald's if you go do that you just gotta like but nobody teaches that stuff nobody yeah. learns that yeah no and again that's why you need to find what works best for you but like those little habits that you create every day like say you're having the same thing for breakfast every day well if you're having mcdonald's versus your home cooked eggs or whatever you're doing like those little things every day add up and then over time it's like yeah this is having a severe effect on your health or whatever it's doing. And it's like those habits, those small ha daily habits add up to something a lot greater and you don't realize it at the time, but as time goes by, it's like you need to change one little thing in your day. And then all of a sudden it's making a massive impact on your life. Right. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. And like Trey said on episode one, two, three or four, I don't remember now um, that he's like, realize that if you're thinking, I mean, if, for the most part, if you're kind of listening to this, you're either a parent who wants their kid to be an, like a big athlete or a player who's trying to really do something with their career on this side. You need to treat yourself like a Porsche, like a Lamborghini, like a high sports car, or if you want to kind of do it like a monster truck kind of thing, depending on what your type, everything you do matters. You know, you don't, you put special oil, you tune up the car. I think that what's what Trace was saying is like, you have to tune up the car before it goes 200 miles an hour. You're not just going to grab a Honda off the street and go 200, you know, you do all these things. That's kind of what we're talking about too. Yeah, no. And there are, and I think people get caught up because they think that, like you said, you're treating your body like that. It's going to cost them a fortune, right? But there are affordable options out there and you need to find those options so that you can still have that balance of, eating healthy and treating your body properly, but not, you know, spending all of your money on, on food. So you, you're broke. You know what I mean? It, it, there is definitely a balance. Um, but there are certain things that you can do. 
and deals that you can find where you can you can make it feasible. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Let's talk about sleep, my dude. How important was sleep for you, especially when you're playing? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I valued it as much as 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 I realized, but um again it's tough right like you're on a bus ride for 12 hours and then all of a sudden you need to go play a game it's like you need to try to find a way to to sleep so you can be rested for that game um and i think it it is definitely challenging but it it can't be an excuse like sleep and nutrition are the number you know one and two things for making your body feel good and and ultimately having that performance that you need um so yeah I i was a guy that needed to get my eight nine hours a night but it's like sometimes it's difficult and you have to adapt and try to make it, make it happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, I mean, realizing, you know, staying away from the internet, staying away from sleep habit, I mean, keeping a a good sleep hygiene, kind of trying to do all these things. It's already hard enough. You know, you're already traveling the bus, this and that, figure it out, you know, reach out, kind of learn, but it's so, so important because if you're not recovering, you're, you're laggy the next day. Again, you're not a sports car, you're not fast. And that's, that's what you're getting paid for to do. Right. Yeah, no, you need to take it into your own hands to make it a priority, right? And and again, if you physically only can get six hours one night, it's like, okay, try to find an hour in the day to take a quick nap and try to make up a little bit because any little bit helps. Like you mentioned, these, these little, little differences can make the difference between you being a little bit laggy during the game or you be feeling a little bit more fresh. And again, when you're facing 95, or like it's, it makes a big impact on your performance um so it definitely needs to be a priority in in your daily life absolutely and absolutely and let's run some numbers for these guys okay let's make a difference let's say um how many at bats did you average out every season in pro ball it was like 400 400 right and the season is about how many uh how long is the season six months six months so we're gonna go six six times four right let's just say this six times four that's 24 weeks let's say um in those 24 weeks we had maybe one hit because we slept better we were quicker we kind of got our body we ate better and all that kind of stuff that's 24 extra hits we're getting on the season what does 24 extra hits do to your career yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna do the the quick math here, but <laughs> I mean, no, I'll def- do it. So if we're hitting, if yeah. we get a hundred, I mean, that's four, that's four hundred. Hundred divided by four hundred, yeah, sure. What is that? So that's a hundred. That's two fifty, yeah. right? So that's if we get a hundred hits normally over four over four hundred at bats, that's two fifty. Now, what happens if we hit a hundred and twenty four over four hundred? You just hit three ten, bro. It's crazy, eh? How crazy is that? Is that changing your career? Is that putting you in the league or what? It's crazy, man. Yeah, it's crazy how, like you said, these little differences you don't realize at the time. What is that? That You said that's one hit a week, right? That's one extra hit a week for the season. So, yeah, you're playing seven games or six games a week, whatever it is. One extra hit in those seven games, which is a lot of at-bats, right? What, 28, 30 at-bats? Mm-hmm. One extra hit. And all of a sudden your average is jumping 60 points over the course of a summer. Like it's crazy. I mean, and, those are two different, like hitting 250 as, as in a season yeah. versus hitting 310, you're getting yeah. called up. Yeah. No. And it's, I think the biggest thing is like realizing that it doesn't take like a lot. It just takes consistency, which has been a big theme doing it day in and day out and making those changes to have more of a positive impact on your day to day, week to week, month to month. And then you look back to the end of the season and you're like, wow, you know? Yes, yes, yes. And I'll kind of, kind of uh, correlate into this. One of, uh, I know that I think it was Dila, the one who used to say this word, eyewash and how much eyewash is in minor league ball. And how do you kind of stop doing that and kind of figure out how do you actually utilize your time? Any, any tips, suggestions you want to kind of leave for guys out there? Well, I think we, we touched on earlier, right. And in, in talking about the quality work versus the quantity work, like the big thing for me, the eyewash was I need to, to go out there and do my early work for an hour to make it seem like I'm working hard. Right. Whereas that, that's not always necessarily the case just because you're out there early and like putting in work, it doesn't mean it's like actually helping you. Um, 
I think realizing what you need to do to work on your weaknesses, develop your strengths, that is what ultimately is going to progress your skill set. And so say you have to go do the early work, it's mandatory, right? It is what it is, or you need to do whatever the coach is telling you to do. And you might think it's eyewash. You need to change it in any way that you can to make it beneficial for you. So if you're taking fly balls and it's like, oh, we're doing fly balls again. Okay, do something to make yourself better. Challenge yourself a little bit, right? Little, little things to make yourself better in that one day of eyewash could, could again translate to something big at the end of the season. Absolutely. Absolutely. And kind of making it a little bit of fun too. You know, it's like figuring out we're all competitive guys, right? So it's like, if you're playing this game, you're competitive. So it's like figuring out, Hey, let's play a little game. You know, whoever gets this many balls, whatever, like figuring out how you're going to make it fun because it is a long season and it it gets monotonous and it gets all this stuff. So just kind of figure out what allows you to kind of keep enjoying the game. So yep. I, I I love what you said that. Um, I also kind of let's take it another another step because I know that in the minor league world um, we see it a lot with uh, playing cards and the all the random shit that happens in the clubhouse. How did you? Because this is a great example that we had on episode two with Mikey Pie is that he kind of talked about how he really focused on figuring out, you know, some of that stuff is great to build camaraderie and stuff, but I need to make sure that my priorities and my routine was getting hit. How did you deal with that? How did you kind of stay like the cool guy kind of thing, still kind of kept it, but hey, this is my list. This is what I need to do with my routine. And no matter what, it's getting done. Yeah, I think there are two sides to it. And there are guys that you see that take everything way too seriously and burn themselves out. And then there are guys that don't take anything seriously enough and they just never get their work in. Right. So I tried to find a balance. And again, I'll be the first to admit, sometimes I took it too far the one way, you know, whether it was playing cards, doing whatever. And like you look up and it's like, Oh my God, the game's in 30 minutes. Right. And and you get caught up in it. Yeah. That happened a few times, but it's like, you learn from that and you learn how to, how to have that balance. I think balance is a key to everything in life, but yeah, especially in this in this situation, it's like you can't be the guy that just doesn't have any fun and doesn't because like you will drive yourself insane. And like we all saw guys that were like that when they got out, they lost their minds because they just weren't having even having fun. So it's like I think there is a balance between enjoying yourself with some of those activities, you know, with your team. But then at, at the end of the day, you need to make sure that you're still getting your work in and doing your routine day in and day out. No, absolutely, man. It's just finding that balance. And sometimes it's a lot a lot harder said than done, but just kind of learning from it and just not not don't get mad when it happens the first or the second time. Just be like, hey, this can't happen again. Cause yeah. I mean, we've all fallen into it. You know, we're all playing cards and it's like, damn, you start getting like just kind of messing around this and that. And then you're like, okay, one more game, one more game. And like, okay, one more more. Just like everything. So it's like, okay, am I that am I an addicted to that? Is that kind of something? Okay, I can't do that. Or am I going to set an alarm on my phone that it's like, when this alarm goes off, that's it. It's like, you know, figure it out. Talk to guys, be like, Hey, like I realized this happened. You're not on it, you know, on this alone. And if you're not self analyzing yourself, like, what are you really doing kind of stuff, you know? Yeah, no, I think that's a great, a great point. And holding yourself accountable is huge. And, and again, we're using the cards example. There's many things that, that kind of come up in, when, in regards to the pro ball routine, the pro ball, distractions, like anything that comes up, that's going to get you away from what you're trying to do. Um, But I think, you know, when it all boils back down to having a routine, it's like, okay, these are my priorities today. I need to hit in the cage for 10 minutes. This is what I need to do. I need to go lift for an hour. I need to eat. I need to do this. Okay. After you have all that set in your daily routine, what do I have time for? Okay. I have an hour to go mess around and play cards. I have this much time to go do this. And like you said, if you want to set a timer, whatever it might be, so that you know that when that time's up, it's time to go to do something else. So you don't get caught up in that. Um, but again, that all that all happens through experience and, and through failing and realizing that you messed up and you need to make an adjustment, right? Absolutely. And kind of at the end of the day, it's your career, right? Like, yeah. I mean, you kind of really, really quickly realize that in pro ball, like these guys are not after you. These guys are not telling you, Hey, 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 let's go. You got to go get your lifted. Hey, 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 you, unless you're a bonus baby and a lazy piece of crap, that's not happening. Let's be yeah. real. So take accountability of your career. Like ask, 
learn, move forward. I mean, if you're listening to this, it's probably because you're, you're, you're that kind of mindset, but it's your career. Anything you want to kind of add to them about that? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, you know, we heard it a million times in the minor leagues, right? It's your career. It's your career. Guys would joke around about it, but like, it is true. And I think the guys that I see that were the most successful were the guys that were very independent. Um, they understood what they needed to do on a daily basis. Again, we played with a lot of guys that worked harder than us, but like, it didn't necessarily pay off. No, like, you know, some guys that were out there for three hours, but like, is it doing anything? No. I also know a lot of guys that weren't in the cage that much, but when they were in there or in the weight room, they were working, right? There was no distractions. There were no distractions. And so I would say, yeah, it is your career. It is what you want to do with it, but just be independent, be accountable, hold yourself accountable and know what you need to do to get yourself performing uh, as best as you can. No, absolutely. Absolutely, man. And and as you talk about that, I think of a buddy of mine, um, the Godi, Alex the Godi, and he's uh, he's had some big league time now with the the Astros. Yep. And um, he's a guy who like if you talk to him while he's like training or doing, he's like, no, yep. I'm working. After yep. that, he's like awesome fun super guy and he's like this is my time i'm gonna focus if i'm hitting i'm focusing on hitting i'm not wasting a swing i'm not wasting a pitch that i'm throwing if i'm catching ground balls i'm focusing on that once i'm done with that drill once i'm done with that all right let's bullshit let's talk but i'm locked in and if you keep yeah. that mind same thing as albert amora i remember watching him back when we were in the 16 year trials and just watching him like shagging like everybody hates his shag nah this kid was in center field every ball off the bat taking it super serious well, now he's yep. in the big leagues. I wonder yep. why. You know, it's like those mentality shifts is what separate those guys from everybody else. Yeah. No, and I think it's it's a little bit uh, deceiving when kids watch on TV, like big leaguers having fun all the time in practice, fooling around. But what they don't realize is either they're so good and they know exactly what they need to do that they'll take their ground ball focus and then all of a sudden they're fooling around. But, you know, as an outside viewer, we see that as, oh, they're just screwing around, taking ground balls, right? But, like, the work that they're doing when they're doing it is extremely focused. And that's why they're so good at what they're doing. Absolutely. And I'll even add to, like, just taking ground balls. Like, yeah, maybe you see them being loose when they're actually getting, like, the ground balls. But you're not seeing the on his knees, you know, hands forward drill that he did before and on the backside with exactly. bare hands or the coach uh, two feet away from him, hitting him quick fungos, like warming his his hands up and doing that stuff. And then he's like, all right, I already did my ru routine. Yeah. And now let me let it loose. And let yeah. me just kind of let me kind of because that's another part. If you're not loose and you're not having fun, you, you, you're, you're kind of stuck. But I wanted to kind of take a quick shift here, man, and just kind of um, last little point here, and then I'll kind of give you the platform to just kind of say yeah. whatever you want. The game, the life after the game, how, how, what's going on there for you? How are you dealing with that? Anything you want to leave for kids out there? Like, because the game ends one day. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think I'm a guy that never really realized that. And I, I don't think anybody does. You know, if you're thinking about what you're doing when you, when you finish your career, like you're not focused on, on your career. Right. Um, I understand you need to plan for your future, but I also know some guys that as soon as they got drafted, they're like, yeah, I'm going to become an accountant. And it's like, yeah, they didn't make it very long in pro ball because they were just focused on that post career. Right. So I think there's definitely, again, a balance there balance. for me. It was like, yeah, I didn't have a specific plan. I knew I wanted to finish school. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I ended up going back when I finished, when I got released um, finished my degree and then I was kind of hanging around COVID hit. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do now? So I ended up training some people back home in Windsor, moved up to Toronto, been training, uh, you know, been fortunate enough to meet some people, meet some clients, um, been pretty steady for the last, I would say year or so. Um, and then, like I mentioned to you, I actually, uh, accepted a medical sales position. So I'm going to be doing that, um, with some training on the side. Um, and again, I think none of this was really planned, but I, but I put myself in a good, uh, spot where these opportunities could kind of arise when when the timing was right no absolutely i mean first question for you is what's what's the goal have you been able to establish like what what your uh, kind of career goals are going to be now or not really uh well no i'm definitely really uh really fascinated with this with this medical sales position i'm start actually starting on monday um 
And Congratulations, big, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The big thing for me that was enticing to me was that um, it's a role that's extremely similar to athletics in that it's competitive. Um, it's a sales position. So again, you kind of write your own paycheck. You're holding yourself accountable. And I think that's, you know, the athlete in me, it was like, this is, this is what I want to do. Um, a lot of the guys I'll be working with are former athletes. So it's like, again, it's a good transition into the, the I say the real world. Right. Yeah. Um, again, I love, I love training my clients. I love being involved in, in the development of these players. Um, and again, I, I want to stay involved and that's why I think, you know, having like these conversations and having the knowledge and experience that we do will help these kids um, as they're moving through the process as well. No, absolutely. I mean, there's kind of two things again uh, with the medical sales. I know a lot of companies that spend a lot of money in creating relationships with uh, college athletics because they know that just being a college athlete and dealing with failure, specifically on the baseball side, specifically yep. on the baseball side, they know that the game will end and they have great, great employees out of there. Yeah. So, you know, it's because you, what you said, it's a competitive nature. It's the, you know, I'm controlling my career because of how hard I work and all that kind of stuff. So that's, it's huge. It's huge. And the other thing I just want to leave for you, man, is you played the game for how many years? 20, 20 something. Yeah. You can't lose that knowledge, man. So like, no. it's, it's something that I'm currently battling with because, you know, I'm, I'm in med school. I'm in my third year of medical school. And it's like, I played the game for 20 years and it's like, yeah, go be a doctor. This and that. But it's like, but you played ball for 20 years. Like yeah. that's worth something. Yeah. So, you know, we're creating this platform for that, you know, is to yeah. be able to share and same thing as your connections. Yeah. Like it's, I mean, your pops is a big leaguer. How many big leaguers do you know right now? Yeah, seriously. Like, I mean, just in the A's, like, you played with Seth, you a played lot, with yeah. Olsen, you played with, uh, you played with, uh, Sean, you played with all these guys with Dalton. Like, yeah, it's, it's crazy, you know, and it's no, it, to us, it's normal. Right. But like you said, it, it's using your experiences to help, you know, guys that value that and that will actually use that. Um, and I think, yeah, any, any direction that you go, it's like, you still have that with you and, and again, you can use it to your, to your full advantage to help anybody that wants to listen. Right. And that's why I'm, I'm really fortunate uh, to be involved with this with you. I'm, I hope that people get something, you know, pause, uh, positive out of it. And, and they're able to, to use this because it is definitely valuable information that I wish, you know, I had access to when I was, uh, you know, growing up. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I mean, first of all, I want to say you're a great speaker. Like <laughs> you, you, you look like you've done this before. I mean, yeah, it's legit. You've been awesome, dude. I mean, be, no. between the knowledge that you've shared, the experiences, everything at all, just the way you handle yourself, both, you know, when you play it to what you're doing now, it's, it's, it's really impressive. And I will, I want to tell you that from the outside, from, you know, not just a friend, but from another guy in the baseball world and everything. I, I love what you're doing. I also want to give you this opportunity to plug yourself in. I know um, where are you releasing your content? How can they help you? Or if they need help, how can they reach out? Just kind of give them what you got. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure, uh, you know, I'll be tagged or whatever it is when, when this gets released, but yeah, I'm on Instagram um, at Brett Siddle. I was on TikTok. I grew quite the following there during the, during the COVID uh, same thing at Brett Siddle. Um, and yeah, that's, Honestly, I've been a little bit quieter with my content now that I have some other things going on, but it's something that I continue to use and continue to be active on to uh, um, kind of spread, you know, my knowledge and my, my content. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And like you said, I mean, everything will be in the description below and all that. I hope you guys enjoyed that episode and learned something valuable from it. If you did, smash that like button as it helps us reach more people just like yourself. But before you go, please consider hitting that subscribe button and turning on the bell notification as my dedication to this YouTube channel and to this podcast is about to explode. And I don't want you guys to miss any of it out. So hit that bell notification, turn that subscriber on. And I know I said it backwards, but who cares? You guys know what I mean. See you guys next time.